So today we will discuss about voice over IP and internet telephony and the basic issues which are associated with voice over IP protocols. So now as you know that the communication over packet switch networks or over internet is in the form of packet. So the first step that needs to be done for carrying voice over internet is to first digitize the voice into the digital signals and then packetize these bits into the packets and then use some transport mechanism to transport these uh, packets over the internet. Apart from transport mechanism, we would also need signaling mechanism to establish the sessions between the sender and the receivers. Okay? So, overall component in terms of the voice over IP are the transport and the transmission mechanisms in the data plane and the control and the signaling mechanisms in the control plane. Okay? So, let me just briefly review the analog to digital conversions. Uh, you might have already studied analog to digital conversions in some other context or in some other course, but in this lecture, let me just briefly review some of the issues uh, which are there in carrying the voice over IP in terms of uh, analog to digital conversions. Okay? So, let us just briefly review the, the A to D conversion and, uh, and also the compression that is needed for carrying the uh, voice uh, over the internet protocols. Remember one thing that um, if you do not have a high bandwidth internet connections, then we may be suffering from scarcity of bandwidth and therefore a compression may be needed in the voice signals for achieving a high efficiency. Okay? So, we will also look into the fact that what are the various compression mechanisms that are used for the transport of voice packets over the IP. Okay. So, now let us start with uh, the analog to digital conversion. Now, as you know that uh, in any a analog to digital speech conversions, there are three steps you know that are required and these three steps are as is one is sampling and uh, another one is quantization and the third one you can say is the actual digitization or discretization. Now, in sampling as you can see the sampling really discretizes the signal in time domain. Okay? So, as you can see here that sampling actually discretizes a signal in time domain and as you know from the Nyquist sampling rate that analog signals should be sampled at a rate which is twice the highest frequency in the signal. Okay? So, an analog speech signal okay, which is a low pass signal typically lying between say 30 hertz to 3 kilohertz okay, or 4 kilohertz would be sampled at a rate which is twice the highest frequency in the signal that is the 4 kilohertz. Okay? So, this is the Nyquist sampling rate and analog signal is sampled at an Nyquist sampling rates and then you get you know various samples. Now, once uh, you have got the samples okay, then you undergo a process of uh, quantization. So, while sampling can be viewed as uh, the as a discretization of the signal in the time domain, the quantization can be viewed as a discretization of the signal in the amplitude domains. Okay. So, so, quantization is actually discretizing the signal in amplitudes and all sample values which falls in a particular interval, they are represented by a single discrete value. Okay? So, you have various quantization levels okay? and uh, the signal sample value. So, for example, you can have uh, quantization levels uh, like this that. So, that means, if a sample value falls above this and uh, but below this then it may be quantized uh, to this level similarly if it falls below this but you know sample value above this then it may be quantized to this level and so on so as a result you know quantization is actually a discretization of the signal in the amplitude domains okay 
Now, as you can see that uh, since this is an approximation of the signal amplitude to the nearest uh, level, it introduces some kind of an error and that error we call it to be a quantization errors. Okay. So, so first step in the analog to digital speech conversion is the sampling. Okay. In sampling, we sample the signal, okay, which is like discretization of the signal in the time domain and this sampling is done at the Nyquist sampling rate and after the samples are obtained, we round them to the nearest level of quantization. So, this is like discretization, this discretizing the signal amplitude, you know, to fixed levels. Okay. So, this is the quantization. Okay. Now, once the quantization is done, then you have the digitization in where each quantization interval is associated in one to one fashion with a binary code words. So, it may be just possible that there are maybe 256 quantization levels, let us say, between plus 5 and minus 5 voltages. Okay. And if there are 256 quantization levels, then each quantization level may be associated with 8 bits. Okay. So, let us say that we have an analog signal which is uh, band limited to 4 kilohertz from 0 to 4 kilohertz, which is a low pass signal, then as per the Nyquist sampling rate, it would be sampled at a rate of 8 kilohertz okay, or 8000 samples per second. And once you get these 8000 samples per second, each sample is then quantized to one of these 256 levels. And after that, each quantization level is represented by 8 bit. So, as a result, you get a bit rate of 8000 into 8 bits per second which gives you 64 kilobits per second. So, that is how you know you get analog to digital speech conversions. Now, as you know that in quantization, what so what we have done in the quantization that the amplitude levels okay, where the signal is likely to occur that is let us say between minus v volts to some plus v volts where this 2 v volts is the range between which the signal amplitudes can, can vary then this quantizations can be either a uniform quantizations. That means, these two signal amplitudes have been divided into uniform levels. So, we call it to be a uniform quantizations or it could be a non-uniform quantizations where you know the, the width of each segment is, is not uniform. Okay. So, now let us look at um, the uniform quantization. So, in uniform quantizations as you know that the range of input voltage, the range of input voltage which may lie between let us say minus v volts to some plus v volts, it is divided into 2 raised to power n segments. Okay, So, that each quantization actually is represented by n bits and then width of each segment is called as a step size. Okay, So, this is how in this case is the width of each segment which we are calling it to be a step size. Okay. Now, uniform quantizations is, is, is actually the normal thing to do, but if it so happens that the probability that the signal amplitudes hovers between the low amplitude values, if that is higher than the probability that it lies it in the high amplitude zones, then what may be done is that we may resort to non-uniform quantizations. Now, what is non-uniform quantizations? In non-uniform quantization, the segment size, the step size are not fixed, okay. but the low amplitude levels, you know, there you may quantize it into more number of levels and the high amplitude levels, you know, you may quantize in less number of levels. So, this results in, into a non-uniform quantization. Logarithmic quantization is kind of non-uniform quantizations where we can maintain reasonably constant signal to noise ratio over a wide dynamic range. Okay. So, what usually you do is that uh, you can have a uniform quantizer, but you quantize not the incoming signal, but the log of the signal. Okay. So, you can actually uh, quantize not the incoming signals, but the, but the log of it and as a result, you know, you can get a logarithmic quantizations. Then we have a adaptive quantizations where the step size is really not fixed, but you dynamically adapt the quantizer step size in response to you know variations in the input signals. Okay. So, what you can do is that you can estimate the slowly varying amplitude of the input signals okay. and then if the input signals is lying between the low amplitude levels, okay, then you know you can have the more number of steps between the low amplitude levels. However, the amplitude, if the signal amplitude is varying, you know, between let us say a plus v to minus v volts, then you know, you can have more number of levels between plus v to minus v. Okay. So, really speaking, the step size, you know, you can adapt depending upon, you know, 
what are the voltage ranges between which the signal amplitude is likely to vary. Now, once the quantization and the digitization process is over, that is, and you have done analog to digital conversions. As I already pointed out that there may be a need to do the uh, compression in the speech, okay, in the audio coding as a part of the audio coding. And for doing this compression, we might want to exploit the temporal correlations that may be there in the speech segments. Okay. So, by exploiting the temporal correlations that may present in the speech segments, we would like you know to compress the speech segments. Okay. So, what we will do is that as a part of the audio coding is we will exploit the temporal correlations in the speech. Okay. So, when we do this, when we achieve the, when we try to achieve the compressions, there are two issues uh, which uh, come up in the context of audio coding. One thing is that we have to worry about the intelligibility and the quality of audio. And secondly, we need to worry about the computational complexity of the codec, you know, which is good. So, we can, while we can exploit the temporal correlations in the speech, we should also take care of the fact that the speech quality is not degraded okay the speech quality remains intelligible and at the same time the algorithms that we use for exploiting the temporal correlations and thereby achieving the compressions they should not be computationally very high and computationally complex okay they should be actually computationally uh, simple okay because this compressions we would be doing actually while online transmissions so, what are the forms of the audio codex? Let us look at what are the forms of the audio codex. There are, there could be two forms of the audio codex. One is what we call as the waveform coders and uh, second one is the model based coders or what is called as the vocoders. Okay. Now, waveform based uh, coders typically work on the speech segments themselves. Okay. So, the speech signal is sampled is quantized and uh, digitized and then compressed. So, those are called the waveform coders. However, the model based coders or the vocoders, okay, they actually are based on the uh, model of the vocal tract okay, and they are also based on the principle of speech synthesis through a model of the vocal tract. Okay. So, that is, that is the fundamental difference between the waveform coders and the model based vocoders. Obviously, as we will see that uh, since the vocoders is the principle of vocoder is based on speech synthesis through a model of the vocal tract, we will see that that will achieve a greater degree of uh, speech compressions uh, than the waveform coders. But then at the same time, the disadvantage of the vocoder would be that the quality of the speech produced uh, would not be a toll quality voice, it would be more like a synthetic voice. Okay. So, now let us look at first what are the typical waveform coders that are used in practice and then we will look at the vocoders. Now, waveform coding as you can see here that uh, the most commonly you know used waveform coding could be which can achieve a greater degree of compression is like linear prediction based where you do the prediction of the future samples from the past quantized samples. So, basically this exploits the fact that there is a correlation between the samples and therefore, you can predict the future samples from the past quantized signals. Now, instead of then quantizing the samples themselves, what you do is that, that you encode the difference between the input samples and the predicted value and then the prediction coefficients are selected to minimize the prediction errors. Okay. So, what really you do is that you quantize the difference between the input samples and the predicted value and not really the sample itself. So, by doing this obviously, you know you can achieve a greater degree of compressions, you will require you know lower bit rate to transmit the information. Because what really are now you are transmitting the information is the difference between the predicted value and the original value. And note that if you transmit this error, then since the receiver can predict the samples and by using this error information, it should be able to more accurately represent the original sample. Now, the, 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 the popular uh, waveform coders are um, as you know that differential pulse code modulations uh, as it is called as the uh, DPCM. In uh, DPCM, uh, typically the 
difference between the adjacent samples is quantized. Okay. So, uh, DPCM is what uh, you know I just told you that a difference between adjacent samples is quantized. Then we can have a adaptive uh, differential pulse code modulations. The difference between ADPCM and D DPCM is that ADPCM includes you know adaptive quantizations and uh, then we also have a uh, delta modulations. Now, delta modulations is, uh, is more like a first order linear predictions and here the sign of the difference, sign of the difference between the input sample and the pass sample is encoded. So, you just need one bit to represent the sign either it is positive then you can represent it by 1, if it is negative you can represent it by 0 and then this bit is used by the decoder to increment or decrement the output by one step size. Okay? So, this way you know at the receiver uh, de depending upon the bit you know the step size will be increased in the positive or negative directions and as such you will get a staircase waveforms which will be closely following the original signals. Okay? So, that is what is called as the delta modulation. Now, so, this, so these are the popular forms of the waveform coders either as the differential pulse code modulations or adaptive pulse code modulations or delta modulations. Now, we uh, and as I already pointed out that since the uh, waveform coders directly work on the speech segments, uh, you know the typical data rates that you can get. As you know with pulse code modulations you can get data rate of 64 kilobits per second and with ADPCM and DPCM you can get data rates of 32 kilobits per second or 16 kilobits per second kind of data rates. But if you have to really go for low bitrate speech coding then the, the coding technique that is used is what is called as the vocoding or vocoder. Now as I have already pointed out the principle of vocoder is a speech synthesis through a model of the vocal tract. Okay. So, now what is done is in the vocoding is that uh, the speech is produced by exciting periodic pulses through a linear system. So, this linear system actually models the vocal tract and the idea is that the, the voiced sounds will be produced by exciting this linear system through periodic pulses. Okay. And of course, this period would may the, the time difference between the two pulses you know may correspond to the pitch of the of the speech okay so by excitation of the periodic pulses of this linear system which actually represents the model of the vocal tract you can actually produce the uh, the sound okay so that is the basic basic principle so what is done at the transmitter you know when the the transmitter actually analyzes the speech okay through a some kind of a linear predictive filters only. So, it analyzes the speech okay, and instead of transmitting you know the quantized values of the speech signals or the digitized values of the speech signals, it actually transmits the coefficients of the models okay, and also the values of the excitation signal energies. So, as a result the number of parameters you know or the number of bits that are required to be sent to the receiver decreases considerably and thereby we achieve a low bitrate speech coding. So, that is precisely the reason why we can get a higher degree of speech compressions by using vocoders. Okay. So, the parameters which are used to model the speech productions are maybe about a dozen coefficients that can define about vocal tract resonance characteristics then a parameter which is specifying whether the source is voiced or unvoiced, the values of excitation energies and so on. So, these are the typical parameters you know which uh, are sent to the receiver so that a model of the vocal tract can be constructed and the values of the excitation signal energies are also given which when feed it into this model will produce exactly the same sound which was produced at the transmitter. Okay. So, this is the principle of speech production at the receiver by using vocoder kind of techniques. Now, obviously you achieve a very great degree of uh, compressions by using this vocoder. Now, remember that some of these parameters which are being transmitted to the receiver, some of them are more important, some of them may be less important and as we will see that in the context of packet communications, some of these parameters which are more important may be given a higher priority packets transmissions and parameters which are not so important may be given as a low priority 
in the packet transmissions okay so so what are the uh, what are really the attributes of a, a low bitrate uh, speech coders as we can see that the bitrate uh, is one of the most important so speech coder for the internet generally will produce the variable bitrate okay since we are using the compression techniques we will also use a silence compression techniques through voice activity detector which determines whether the input signal is uh, speech which de determines whether the input signal is uh, speech or noise okay so that is very important by using this voice activity detector you will determine whether the input signal is speech or noise and if it is noise then you do not encode that part of the speech segment so that thereby also you can result a reduction in the bit rate okay so the voice but however since you are not transmitting anything during the silence part that is during the unvoiced part so at the receiver you know it may generate some irritating uh, feeling and therefore you know typically at the receiver you will generate what is called as the comfort noise so there will be a voice activity detector at the transmitter and at the receiver you will require a corresponding comfort noise generations okay so that you know which can fill in between these silence spurts okay so at other attribute is the delay you know how much is the delay that is required in the speech coders there could be several forms of delay like the uh, algorithmic delay the processing delay or the communications delay and of course the other parameters are the complexity of the speech coders and also the quality so we have already discussed what are the attributes that should be there for the speech coder one is of course the bitrate is most important we should get as low bitrate as possible we should try to achieve a very low bitrate speech coder for the for the internet but apart from the bitrate as we have already seen that the delay which will be there as a speech codec the quality the intelligibility of the speech and the computational complexity are also important issues so there could be trade off between these various attributes and uh, depending upon the applications depending upon the bandwidth which is available over the internet you know one can have a choice of uh, speech coders in a uh, particular voice over ip context okay so now uh, we have studied you know the analog to digital conversion parts now let's look at what are the other important aspects of the voice over ip so let me just sketch a brief block diagram of the voice over ip you know phone that may be present okay so it would be something like this that uh, you have the speech you got this analog to digital conversions and some kind of audio codec okay so this is like the audio codec part so both is actually doing the analog to digital conversions and the and the compressions and the audio codecs basically analog to digital conversions can also be you know incorporated as a part of the audio codec itself now once uh, you get this uh, you basically are having the transport protocol for packetization because then you know you are then transmitting uh, these uh, voice samples or voice digits into the packet so this is the transport protocols now typically you know you can assume that your voice is having from 0 to 4 kilohertz and let us say that you have sampled it at the rate of 8000 samples per second and then you know you have resulted into 8 bits for each sample and as a result you may have resulted into 64 kilobits per second okay let us say that we are not using any compressions okay so let us for the time being assume that uh, you know we are not using any uh, compressions we are using pcm kind of compressions okay so if you do this then uh, so what is typically done in the internet phone you have the talk spurts which is encoded using 64 kilobits per second which is like 8 kilobytes per second and then these bytes are put into the packets say every 20 milliseconds a header is appended and then we send it using the udp as the as the transport protocols okay so now in this scenario what we see is that 
you will encode about of 20 milliseconds. So when you say 20 milliseconds and if you are having 64 kilobits per second, then you will generate about uh, 160 bytes of data. So what you can do is that, that you can put 160 bytes here, you can append a header and then you know you can send using a UDP. So this you can give it to a UDP user datagram protocol for transmissions. Now this will be typically the transport of the packet voice over the internet. Now several issues come up here, we will, uh, we will uh, take up many of these issues. The first thing is that when the voice is getting digitized okay, and the, when the bits are coming, whether you know we should take the speech segment for 20 milliseconds or 5 milliseconds or uh, you know 50 milliseconds, uh, so there are issues. Now the issues are that uh, if we wait for let us say 50 millisecond, then obviously you know you encounter some kind of uh, delay and uh, because you will have to wait for that much data to get accumulate at the transmitters, so you encounter that much of the delay. But what is the advantage? The advantage is that when you get this payload and append an header, remember that the header or the overhead associated with the header is typically the same irrespective of the payload size. So obviously if the payload size is more, the overhead associated with the packet will be smaller. So ideally we would like this payload to be as large as possible in the packets. Okay? But then the downside of that is that we will have to wait for a long enough time and since we will have to wait for a long enough time, we would encounter the latencies and the delays which will be unacceptable for the voice communications. So therefore, a trade-off needs to be achieved between the delay that would occur in accumulating the packets and the overheads that would be associated with the headers. Okay? So typical applications, uh, they will take the bytes for each 20 milliseconds, uh, put them into the packets, append a header and then send. Now the, another question that arises is that what kind of transport protocols should be used for transmitting these voice packets? Should we use uh, TCP or should we use uh, UDP? So as I just pointed out that typically the transport protocol that is used in the voice over IP communications is the user datagram protocol or UDP. So the question really is that why UDP? Why uh, you know we would like to use the, the UDP as a protocol? So one thing that is important to understand that that in the TCP, first of all, the TCP provides you the reliable transport mechanisms and the UDP provides you unreliable transport mechanisms. Okay. So how does TCP provide reliable transport mechanism? Since TCP provides reliable transport mechanisms, it also looks for the acknowledgments of the packets and if the packets have been lost or if the packets have been received in error, then TCP allows for the retransmission of the packets again to the receiver. Now note that uh, in the real time communications like voice, retransmission of packets is not possible and therefore you know you do not need mechanisms like retransmissions and uh, you know retransmission of packets and the reliability of this kind in the in the voice communications so so therefore you know the tcp uh, is not used typically you know the only the udp as the transport mechanism is used so if some packets have been lost in the internet either due to congestions or due to errors then you know they would be considered as lost and uh, thereby uh, there may be an effect in the speech quality but you will typically not look for retransmission of those uh, packets. So that is why you know the, the packets are sent using UDP as a transport mechanism. Okay? So now what are the components of the data plan that we have discussed? So first we have seen that will require an audio codec. Okay, so the audio codec will actually generate a low bitrate speech uh, digits and then these uh, digits would be packetized and then be sent using UDP as a transport mechanism over the internet. And at the other side of course you can receive these UDP packets, you can collect those, depacketize those packets, collect those bits, convert them into speech signals again and then play them out. So this is the normal process. Okay? But is it really then possible to achieve a acceptable voice over IP communications by using this kind of mechanism? 
what are the issues that are involved okay and how to improve the speech quality that is what will be the part of our discussions that we will do in the in the next few minutes okay so now let's look at um, what are the real problems for the real time services okay if you try to transmit it like the way which i have just explained so one thing is that so remember one thing that we are assuming right now that these packet transmissions of voice over ip or internet telephony which we are doing it over the internet we are our assumption is that our internet is not offering any quality of service guarantees okay so we are assuming that the the packet switch networks that we have got does not offer any quality of service guarantees it is a best effort networks okay so that is our assumption and what we are saying is that over these best effort networks we are trying to achieve the transport of this real time services okay using the mechanisms that are there at our disposals okay so that is what we are saying now assuming that the internet is the best effort networks or is a non qos networks then what are the problems that would occur for the real time services so we'll we'll look at that and then we will see how we can address those problems okay now as you see that the packet loss can occur because the network is a non qos network but as we have just already pointed out that retransmission mechanism is not suitable okay now typically in a best effort network the when the packet loss occurs the packet loss is uh, taken care by using a suitable retransmission mechanisms but as we have just observed for the real time services retransmission mechanism is not suitable but the good thing is that that in this packetized voice communications 10 to 20% of the packet losses can be tolerated depending upon the applications okay so that is the that is a good part of this that 10 to 20% of the packet loss can be tolerated it will not affect or degrade the speech quality as much okay and uh, and therefore really speaking if somehow if the load on the internet is light if it is not heavily loaded and the packet losses can be contained to not a very significant fraction of the total packets transmitted then it should be possible for us to have a very good intelligible speech without having you know appreciable degradations okay so you know that is the you know that is the thing that we should hope for but even if there is some packet loss you know which is above this then as i have already pointed out that since retransmission mechanism is not suitable the the mechanism that will be used uh, for voice over ip applications will be forward error correcting codes or fecs typically forward error correcting codes will be used to conceal these packet losses i will describe in detail how fec can be used to conceal the packet losses but what we are saying is that let us say that if there is a packet loss then we will have mechanisms like fecs to conceal these packet loss the second thing that problem arises is of the end to end delay okay now as you know that delay smaller than 150 milliseconds they are not perceived by the human beings okay so that is another good thing that if an end to end delay is of the order of 150 milliseconds then typically they are not perceived by the human beings depending again upon the applications delays in the range of 150 to 450 milliseconds may be tolerable okay so the so while the packet loss can be contained by using forward error correcting codes okay the delays even if there are packet delays of the order of 150 to 450 milliseconds depending upon the applications okay if it is a streaming audio kind of applications then larger delays like 450 milliseconds may be acceptable okay if it is a two way interactive phone conversations then lower delays like 100 milliseconds or 150 milliseconds they are desirable okay so the end to end delays you know may not be a great problem if these delays are again within acceptable or tolerable limits now assuming that the internet is lightly loaded let us say even though internet is not offering any quality of service guarantees suppose that the internet is lightly loaded and therefore the packet losses are contained to let us say 10% okay and let us say that the delays is less than 150 milliseconds then the question that we should ask ourselves is is it possible to have acceptable and good voice over ip conversations over a such a non qos enabled internet now can we do like this that we assume that we digitize the speech using audio codec packetize it and then transmit it using an udp segment over this best effort but lightly loaded internet is it possible to have that acceptable voice communication unfortunately the answer is that no why 
it may be possible to have the end to end delays smaller than 150 milliseconds okay that may be possible to have well, smaller than 150 millisecond unfortunately another serious problem that arises is due to the fact that different packets will experience different delays okay if all packets are experiencing the same delay of 150 milliseconds then that is not a problem unfortunately since different packets are likely to experience different delays okay that results you know in the problem of delay jitter and this delay jitter actually degrades the speech quality okay so that is you know one of the greater issues you know that we need to address that how to address the problem of the delay jitter in the uh, voice over ip communications so now uh, we will actually see that um, since the retransmission mechanism is not possible in the packet loss, how to address the problem of uh, packet loss in the voice over IP conversation, how to address the problem of the delay jitter which occurs due to random queuing delays and different packets experiencing uh, you know the different delays. Okay? So now uh, we will address uh, all these problems. So now let us look at how to address each of these problems individually or separately so let us look at first the problem of the delay jitter okay so we will see how the problem of the delay jitter can be addressed now as you know that the problem of the delay jitter is that that it happens because at the transmitter so and uh, this can be of course through the internet and then we have the receiver at the transmitter, the packets may have been generated in certain order. So, this is at the transmitter. However, at the receiver, since each packet is received at the receiver with a different delay, then this packet may for example, may be received here this packet may be received here, this packet may be received here, then this packet may suffer a large delay and similarly this packet may suffer this delay. Now, as you can see here that the periodicity with which the packets were generated at the transmitter, that periodicity is completely lost okay, in, the, in the receiver here. Okay. So, this periodicity as you can see is completely lost. So, if these speech segments are given to the receiver for play out, then the speech quality will be definitely degraded. Okay. So, now the question really is that how to address the problem of the delay jitter. Okay. So, the question really is that how to address this delay jitter problem. Now, the answer to the question of the delay jitter is that, that we can use at the receiver what is called as the play out buffer. Okay? So, the solution for this is okay, to use the play out buffer. Now, what is a play out buffer? The play out buffer is actually a buffer which is used at the receiver where the arriving packets are stored and then these packets are played out at an appropriate time. Okay. So, the packets are allowed to wait in the buffer for some amount of time and then played out at appropriate time. Okay. So, that is why this is called as the play out buffer. Okay. Just to give you an example of fixed play out buffer algorithms. Okay. So, the fixed play out buffer algorithms will work something like this that let us say that this is you know I denote it this with the time and this with the let us say sequence number. Let us say the transmitter the packets are generated like this. Let us say the first packet is generated here, the second packet is generated here, the third packet is generated here and so on. And let us say that these packets they arrive at different times. So, this is the time of arrival. Now, what you can do is that, that in the fixed play out buffer algorithm, 
you can actually start playing the packets like this. So, the first packet you can play it here. So, this packet which was transmitted at this time it arrived here, but it was played here. So, this packet has to wait in the queue for this much amount of time. This packet does not have to wait because you know it really suffered a large amount of delay in the network. This packet which was transmitted here it arrived here this packet may have to be wait for this much time and similarly you know for this packet and, and so on. Okay. So, this way you know each packet can wait some amount of time appropriate amount of time in the play out buffer and then you know the packets can be played out. Okay. If you really see that let us say that T i is the time of generation of ith packet let us say that T i is time of generation of ith packet and R i is the time of reception of ith packet. Then as you can see here that in the fixed play out buffer algorithm in fixed in the fixed play out buffer algorithm as you can see the packet p i will be played at the time t i plus d max where d max happens to be the maximum delay in the network. As you can see actually the ith packet suffered a delay d i equal to r i minus t i. This was the time at which the ith packet arrived and this was the time at which the ith packet was transmitted. So, d i is equal to r i minus t i was the delay of the ith packet. Okay. The play out time of the ith packet is t i plus d max okay. and therefore, the, uh, the packet the ith packet has to wait in the buffer for the amount of time if I write d i which is the buffer which is equal to d max minus d i it had to wait in the buffer for this much amount of time right. So, different packets will have to wait in the buffer for you know the different amounts of time. So, now as you can see here that one thing that is important is, is that that uh, you need to know the bound on the maximum delay that is the d max okay that needs to be known okay now in actual practice this value of d max may not be may not be known okay in a network which provides quality of service guarantees it would be desirable to give a quality of service in terms of the maximum delay that the network can provide so, however, you know as, as we have seen in practice it may not be possible to do that and therefore, uh, moreover this value of the d max you know may not be known at the receiver. So, one of course, can take a conservative estimate and one can take the value of d max to be very large. Now, the problem here however, is that that if you keep the value of d max to be very large then what really happens is. Uh, that uh, it increases the latency because the packets then really have to wait in the play out buffer for uh, you know the corresponding amount of time till their time to play out comes. Okay. So, this may actually introduce latency while this may not be a serious problem in the streaming audio applications actually this may become a significant issue in the two way interactive phone conversations. So, what is alternative and the alternative is that instead of using this d max instead of using this d max one must use some other values Maybe you know p i is equal to t i plus some d hat some you know d value it should be used. The question really is that what should be the value of this d hat that needs to be used. If d hat is kept equal to d max or a very large value then it it increases the latency. Now, let us suppose that if I keep the d hat value to be some value and ith packet arrives or suffers a larger delay in the network and therefore, it arrives at a time r i where r i happens to be larger than p i. So, if 
the ith packet arrives such that r i happens to be larger than p i, then ith packet will be dropped. Right? The ith packet will be dropped okay, if it arrives after its playback time. Okay? Now, there is a trade off here. The trade off here is in between the latency and the packet loss rate. Okay? Somehow, if we can adaptively adjust the value of the delay d hat in such a manner that the number of packets which arrive after their scheduled playback time, if that is minimized, at the same time, this value of d hat is not that large such that the latency is not affected, then we can have a large number of packets being played out okay, and having not much degradation in the speech quality and also having an acceptable latency. So, those algorithms are actually called as the adaptive playback buffer algorithm. Okay. So, what is done in the adaptive playback buffer algorithm is the delay, the, de the estimated delay is uh, used, you know, instead of the instead of the maximum delay. Okay. So, I will just present one adaptive playback buffer algorithms that has been used uh, in the literature. Okay. So, that adaptive playback buffer algorithms is works like this that you estimate the delay d i hat for the i th packet to be 1 minus alpha of uh, d i minus 1 hat into alpha of uh, r i minus t i. This is the actual delay. Okay? So, this is like what we are doing is that, that the, the delay d i hat is estimated using this equation. So, this is really a moving average. Okay? So, this is a, a low pass filtered version. Okay? And as you can see here that alpha is a constant which lies between 0 and 1. If it is kept close to 1, then this uh, d i hat is a more a reflection of the current delay. On the other hand, if this alpha is close to 0, then this actually filters out any temporary fluctuations in the delays right so this is how di hat is estimated you also have the variance uh, vi hat the variance vi hat is estimated as 1 minus alpha vi minus 1 plus alpha into ri minus ti minus di hat so this is like the variance and then the playback time pi is at given as t i plus d i hat plus some beta times you know the variance. Okay? So, instead of using you know as we have seen that in the fixed playback buffer algorithm. So, what we were doing it in the fixed playback uh, buffer algorithm. So, we are doing p i is equal to t i plus uh, d max. So, instead of saying t i plus d max we are using you know p i plus d i hat plus beta times v i here. This is the estimated values of the delay and of course, a constant time the variance we are using. Okay? So, uh, what we are really doing is um, we are estimating the delays and the variance of the packet delays and then adaptively adjusting the playback times. Okay? The objective of course, is to minimize the packet loss and also to sort of minimize the latencies. Okay? Now, the question really it arises now is as we have seen here. So, again you know to recapitulate our voice over IP thing, what we have said is that we will digitize the voice, we will have the, we will compress the voice, we will have an audio codec, we will packetize the voice maybe by collecting the speech segments of 20 milliseconds. Okay? And after doing this, we will transmit it over the UDP segments uh, over a best effort internet. But as we have already seen since we transmit it over a best effort internet we will be faced with the problem of combating this delay jitter and to combat the delay jitter we will have to 
queue those packets in the playback buffer at the receiver and then play them out using an appropriate playback buffer algorithms. Now, as we have seen in both the algorithms, in the we, we consider two playback buffer algorithms. One was the fixed playback buffer algorithms and another one was the adaptive playback buffer algorithms. And what we have seen that in the fixed playback buffer algorithms, we may require an accurate knowledge of the D max okay, or the maximum delay. In the adaptive playback buffer algorithms, we can adaptively adjust the playback time so as to minimize the packet loss and the latency. But in both these cases, as you have actually seen, what really we need is that we need to know the time of generation of the packet. The TI needs to be known, right? As we have seen here, the TI should be known. So then the question really is that we need to timestamp the packets. Okay? So that is one aspect that we need to sort of timestamp the packets. The another thing that would arrive here is that as uh, you know that we will typically you know in the playback buffer algorithms in the adaptive playback buffer algorithms we will determine the playback time of the first packet of the talk spurt only. The later on of course you know you can determine as you know how these packets are spaced between the talk spurts. So in adaptive playback buffer algorithms typically we will adjust the playback time of the first packet only. Okay. So now suppose if some packets are lost, okay, so how will you determine that it is the first packet if you know uh, the packet has been lost. So we will determine that if ti minus 1, if it is greater than 20 milliseconds then ith packet is the first packet of the talk spurts. Okay. So what if there is a packet loss? So if there is a packet loss then we would require sequence numbering of the packets and we will take the help of sequence numbers. So basically what we are saying is that in the transport protocol we need time stamping the packets and we also need sequencing of the packets. Then the question is that we need some more information other than, than what is available with the UDP. So that means we uh, require a separate transport protocol which would enable the transport of the packet voice. And that separate transport protocol is called as real time protocol or RTP. So we will study uh, you know in the next lectures the RTP and then how to carry the packets using RTP and other signaling aspects of the voice over IP.